Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. I hope you all are having a fantastic day. Before we get started, please let me know if you can hear me. If a few people would type in, yes, you can hear me. We will be good to go with that. We have a lot of people here today. We have um, some regulars who are here all the time. We have Alan, William, Brandon, Keith, all sorts of people who are normally here and also a lot of new people. So you all can hear me, so that is fantastic. Let me let you know a little bit about the structure of this webinar today. We're going to be discussing combating overly aggressive, almost maniacal players. It's a topic that gives a lot of people a ton of trouble. So we will be discussing that. Um, and then after that, we're going to have a question and answer session where you'll be able to type in your questions and I will answer them. So let's get right to it. Um, before we do get started, though, I do want to let you all know that at the end of this webinar, we're going to be giving you a free download link to a gift. It's going to be my tournament poker cheat sheet in um, audio format, video format, and a PDF. So you can download it and take it with you to the table. So make sure you stick around until the end of this webinar for that. So here is the question I pose to all of you. It's a long question. We're just going to go one step at a time, though. Um, I, I emailed this out to everyone and a lot of people, like 50 people emailed in saying, well, you didn't say what hand we had, right? But in reality, the hand you have does not matter so much. What matters is how do you play your entire range? This is how you have to think about poker if you wanna succeed at a high level. You can't just think, how do I play my pocket jacks or my nine seven suited? You want to instead think, how do I play my whole range? How do I keep it balanced? And we're gonna be discussing that extensively today. So. Everyone folds to you on the button with 100 big blinds in a $500 buy-in tournament, okay? Simple enough. The players in the blinds are overly aggressive, almost maniacal. All right. What is your strategy? This is where a lot of people thought we needed to have with uh, a specific hand, but you don't. So on the right, you see here, our whole range. This is roughly the range that I will raise with when they fold to me, all these hands that are not in white, okay? Pretty self-explanatory. All the pairs, suited aces, big cards. A few um, weak hands, like ace, seven offsuit, five, four suited, etc. You could even tighten this up a little bit more. But notice, this is actually me playing only 30% of hands on the button. Um, normally, you're going to want to play something like 50% of hands on the button, maybe even 60% of hands on the button. But in this scenario, where you expect to face aggression... Well, in, in that scenario, you really, really, really do not want to be raising with too much garbage because you have to fold to re-raises too often, right? So let's just take a look at this range and how we plan on playing it against our opponent. So we're going to raise with all the hands in red with the idea that we're going to be four betting for value. So we're going to raise with the hands in red, and if our opponent re-raises, we're going to re-raise him back purely for value because these hands are great. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. All these hands are good enough to play a big pot against a maniac. If this was a tight opponent who was re-raising this, I would not be re-raising ace-queen suited or pocket jacks or maybe even ace-king offsuit because those hands don't want to necessarily get all in against a very, very tight player. Harry says he's not seeing my chart. If you all can see my screen, please let me know. You should be seeing this chart on the screen. Tough to distinguish for colorblind people. Well, I can't help you with that right now. Um, seems like everyone can see it, though, so that's good. Good. Fortunately for you all, I'm going to actually go through and explain most of the hands, right? Next, we have the hands in blue. Well, actually, let's take a look at the hands in green. The hands in green are the hands that are raising and then calling a re-raise. These are hands that stand to be pretty good. These are not your absolute best hands, but these are hands that are pretty good. They can easily see a flop. You want to see a flop with pairs in position against a maniac, right? Because if you get a set, you're going to be in great shape. You want to see a flop with king 10 suited. Because even though, you know, the maniac may have you dominated, he could also be three betting king five offsuit, right? So these are just the best hands that flop well. And that leaves a bunch of other rather junky hands in our range. And we need to pick some of these to be used as bluffs. A lot of people also emailed in saying, oh, I would never bluff a maniac. But you have to understand that maniacs win because you fold too often. They expect you to react straightforwardly. Don't forget that. These players win because you fold too much. So 
the worst thing you can do is fold too much, all right? So we know right off the bat, if I raise and get three bet, I'm gonna need to defend 60 to 70% of our range. And you see here, we're defending, um, well, 100% of what we're playing minus 32%. That is 67.5% of our range, right? So we're right at a sweet spot in terms of uh, fundamentally sound strategies, just trying to keep up with the minimum defense frequency. So we need to defend at least the hands in red, green, or blue. The question is, how should you defend them? And you do need to fight fire with fire sometimes. A lot of people are afraid of this. They think that, oh, if I re-raise, the maniac is then going to go all in on me. Well, understand that's fine because we're going to crush the maniac with all the hands in red, right? We're playing all the hands in red, the best hands, and the hands in blue aggressively with the idea that if our opponent does just blast it in on us, we have the nuts a lot of the time, and that's great. Notice we have, um, for our re-raising range, our four-betting range, half of our hands are nuts, half of them are quote-unquote bluffs. Um, realize that whenever you do four bet, your opponent will call sometimes. So it's not like the bluffs just lose every single time. And also your opponent is going to fold a lot. I can guarantee you most maniacs who are not just legitimately terrible are going to fold your four bet a decent amount of the time because they assume you are going to be a weak tight knit as all of the other weak tight knits are. Whenever they get three bet, they just call with everything. Besides the best hands, they four bet those. The maniac folds, and then you know the maniac moves on with their lives because they ran into aces, so they fold. So do not be afraid to get in there and fight. Maniacs win because you fold too much. Don't fold too much. That is very, very important. Is the four bet all in or three times the three bet? No, 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 no. Um, we should make this clear. So let's say we do make it... Um, what was the question? Say we do make it two and a half big blinds. Our opponent's going to make it something like eight big blinds. We're going to make it something like 20 big blinds in position. We want our bluffs to be relatively cheap. Also, take a look at the bluffing selection we're using. Ace four suited, ace, ace five suited, ace two suited, king nine suited, queen nine suited, jack nine suited, queen jack offsuit, ace nine offsuit, right? All of those hands flop well enough besides ace nine offsuit. That's just a pure blocker bluff with the ace. But all the other hands, ha they're going to flop pretty well. So we don't really care if our opponent calls because we're going to be in position. And remember, we have tens and better, an ace-queen suited and better in our range too, that's going to be crushing our opponent. So we're going to be re-raising small. And then if our opponent does go all in for 100 big blinds, well, you know, you're going to fold out the hands in blue and then you're going to crush them with the hands in red. And um, something a lot of people are afraid of is uh, getting stacked, right? We have to understand we're, we're playing relatively deep stacked in a tournament and you want to play big pots as a substantial favorite. And whenever you do get all of your money in, even with pocket tens or ace queen suited against a legitimate maniac, you are going to be in fine shape. So this is the pre-flop strategy. Let's go on to the flop. Suppose we raise the two big blinds pre-flop and the a big blind calls a maniac. Flop comes jack, seven, six. Your opponent checks. What is our strategy? Again, we need to prepare to face aggression. What you want to do is you want to break down your range into four categories. Premium made hands, which you're almost always going to bet. Draws, which you're usually also almost always going to bet. Marginal made hands, which usually are going to check. And junk, which you're usually going to check. Now let's talk about um, ideal proportions. Typically, you want your betting range to be at most two draws to every one mar uh, premium made hand. So right here, notice we have 21% draws, 14% premium made hands. That's a 1.5 to 1 ratio, so that's fine. What you don't have is you don't have like 40% draws because then you have way too many bluffs in your range. And this is why you can't continuation bet with 100% of your range because often you just end up with too much garbage. So this ratio is pretty nice. Um, against a maniac who you do expect to play back at you a lot, you would prefer to have closer to a 1 to 1 ratio and instead of a 2 to 1 ratio. And like I said, we're at a 1.5 to 1 ratio. If you do look at the selection of hands that are colored in blue, though, you'll see that a lot of these aren't draws that many people think of as typical draws. We have king-queen, right? King-queen on jack-7-6. Is that really a draw? Well, it's two over cards that lack showdown value. So yes, it essentially is. It's a, it's a very clean six-out draw. We have ace-4 of spades, hearts, and diamonds. An over card with a backdoor flush draw with a backdoor gut shot, right? Not a great draw, but it is indeed a draw. And that's okay, because if you look at our premium made hands, the hands in red, it is king, jack, and better. So top pair, second kicker, and better. These hands are just going to be the nuts, right? We are thrilled to get in with all these. So as your premium made hands get stronger, and like I said here, all the premium made hands are great, your bluffs with draws can get weaker, and that's fine. Um, also, we're betting with our gut shots. 
really, we just don't have very many obvious draws here. And that's okay. It's okay to not have very many obvious draws. And when you don't have very many obvious draws, you need to search for them. I messed up a little bit here. 5-4 uh, four, four suited should also be a draw. I said that it was junk, but it should be a draw. So that was my fault when I was making this. So that is the ratio of premium made hands to draws. Brian says, we're betting top set against the Maniac. Absolutely. Glenn says, if I didn't indicate suit on some of these, that means we're betting with all of them. Well, first off, we're not raising, you say we're not raising. We're not raising any of these. This is, assumes our opponent checks. When your opponent checks, you cannot raise, you can only bet, right? So in this scenario, um, Oh, look, Samuel pointed out somewhere else I messed up. You'll find it whenever you're making these ranges, it's easy to mess up. Ace-7 should be a marginal made hand. That is my bad. Ace-9 should also be a marginal made hand, too. Good good catch, Samuel. I'm glad you all are watching me. Whenever you have hundreds of eyes looking at you, inevitably they will catch things that you screw up. So, yes, 5-4 shoots should be a um, draw. Ace-7 offsuit should be a marginal made hand that checks. My apologies. It's not going to matter for this question moving forward, though. Um, if I didn't indicate suits, that means we're using all of those. So like 10-9 of spades, hearts, diamonds, and clubs, we are, um, we're betting all of, all of them. But we're only betting ace-3 of spades, hearts, and diamonds because those are um, backdoor draws, right? Why is ace-9 a marginal made hand? Because with ace-9, we're going to check behind on the flop, call a turn bet on almost all turns, and then evaluate on the river. We are not going to go through that portion of the decision tree here. Really, the, the flop can go two ways. Either our opponent can check-raise us. Actually, it can go three ways. Our opponent can check-raise us, in which case we have all the hands in red and blue in our range. Our opponent can check-call us, in which case we also have all the red and the blue. Or it can go check-check, in which case we have all of the gray and the green. So let's talk about that real quick. You want your marginal made range... And your junk range that you're both checking, we're checking pocket tens on this board. We're checking jack nine, top pair on this board, because we want to have two marginal made hands to every one junk hand at least. And it's usually better to have even more against the maniac. And that's because we need to defend way more than the minimum defense frequency. And we'll talk about that in just a second, because we're about to get check raised here. Um, but... What, the way this works out is you're, you want to fold roughly 30% of your range when you're checking behind range on the turn and then fold 30% more of it on the river. That's going to make you very close to unexploitable. And against the Maniac, you need to be calling even more. So keep that in mind, right? So in this scenario, we need to be checking back with a range of, you know, 70% marginal made hands, 30% junk. And it turns out our range breaks down pretty nicely like that. Also, again, I screwed up the chart a little bit. 5-4 suited is a draw. So that's fine. That's going to make our junk lower, which is great. And a seven offsuit is a marginal made hand. That's also going to give us more uh, marginal, marginal made hands and less junk. So that is also great. Alexis says, assuming any other player type, we're we betting our junk. No, we're not. We're absolutely not. The range would be um, situated a little bit differently. We'd be likely betting with just more hands in general, but those would essentially be draws. You always want to compartmentalize the hands and figure out what, why you are betting them. How do you see what other players are asking? You cannot. Uh, let's see. Our backdoor draw is not... Our, our, our ace-five suited with the backdoor draw not good enough to check behind. No, generally not. Just because you're not going to realize equity that often. Then you, you want to have some bluffs on the turn. Let's see. You could also face an aggressive and different player in the blinds. Not easy to implement the strategy against two different player types. Well, first off, the question was against um, the question was against two maniacs. But no, like if you're playing against multiple opponents and you see a flop against two players, that changes things, right? You have to understand that we need to discuss very specific situations, right? And that's how you're going to figure out how to learn to break down your range. I'm not talking about a bunch of hypothetical spots because then we're never specific. We need to be specific. Bob's asking me about someone else's book. I do not know. Versus a villain with a high fold to continuation bet stat, is it fine to bet 100%? Absolutely, because then you're exploiting your opponent, right? In this scenario, remember, we are going to exploit this opponent by not folding as often as he thinks we will. So how do we do that? We need to make sure we protect our checking range by having that 70% to 30% ratio, which is right at what we have. And we want to make sure we have a relatively strong betting range, which we also have, right? 
Is ace 10 or ace 9 ever not marginal? I mean, listen, these are marginal mainly because we plan on calling any turn bet from a, a loose and aggressive player. Do we distinguish between these different draws? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously the draws are of different strengths. But, um, like, obviously king Queen's not a very good draw here, right? And 9-8 suited is a very good draw. And 10-9 is not a very good draw. But they're all draws, and they need to be... They're, they're being bet, right? These hands are all be playing roughly the same way. Now, obviously... You could say, well, don't you want to mix up the way you play a lot of these hands? And sure, you do if you're trying to play perfect game theory optimal, but we're not, right? Here, we are trying to teach you a strategy that is easy to implement that will be sort of an approximation of the game theory optimal strategy against someone who tries to make you fold too much. Is there ever a case of checking the premium hands? Probably just no. JJ Cohen is not reading the question right. You're saying, what if you call with ace-10? You can't call with ace-10 because we are in position in this hand. Is our intention to take this to the river? I'm not sure what that means. We want to. We, we don't want to re-raise the opponent because the opponent's going to then fold all of his junk. We're not playing against someone who's awful. Remember, we're not playing against a terrible maniac. Here. We're playing against someone who's pretty decent. If you check behind with ace-10, you're calling a turn bet whether you improve or not. Could Queen Jack be good enough to bet? Sure, but take a look at this. This is why it's very important that you break down your range. What happens if you bet Queen Jack and Jack 10 and Jack 9? Well, it's 12 combinations of Queen Jack and Jack 10, right? So 12 combinations would leave the marginal made range and go to the premium made range. So now it'd be 75 combinations here to 77. So that's not ideal. We're at 1 to 1 instead of 1.5 or 2 to 1. And then we have fewer marginal made hands, right? So now... When we check behind on the flop, we are going to be susceptible to our opponent just blindly betting with all of his range and crushing us. And this is why you can't just bet all of your top pairs, because you become really easy to play against. It's a big takeaway I want all of you to have from this webinar. Um, I mean, it's a ratio thing because it's about protecting your betting range and your checking range. When I think of a maniac, what do I think of? Someone who bets too often? Yes. Someone who bets too much? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Mainly just too often. They're going to attack weakness. These are people who attack weakness. Let's see. While you're at the table, is this type of thing intuitive? I mean, and, and most of the time you're going to come up with something like this in your head while you're playing at the table. But at the same time, if you study these spots, you start to understand there's really only like 300 spots that can come up on the flop. Then they're all just slightly different. If you see bet with a draw, what happens? Well, here we go. We're continuation betting with a draw. And our opponent raises. We bet 2.5 big blinds. That means every hand over here in green and gray goes away. They are no longer in our range. They are out of here. Right? Because we checked with them. Since we checked with them, we don't have them when we bet. Edward says, is it terrible to put nines and eights in our betting range? Probably. Because they're very good marginal made hands. All right, so we, we lose all of our green and gray hands. This is what we're left with. Our opponent raises us. Does it make sense to slow play? No, because our checking range was naturally strong. It was all it was a lot of top pairs and medium pairs. We don't need to worry about that if you balance it well. What's the best way to internalize and practice these spots? <laughs> we'll talk about that in a little bit because I'm going to give you all access to lots and lots of questions just like this. All right. Is your bet sizing based on your hand strength? No, no I'm using the same bet size with everything unless our opponent is really bad. All right. Suppose we bet and our opponent raises to eight big blinds. What is our strategy? First off, what is the minimum defense frequency? Minimum defense, defense frequency is your opponent. It's one minus your opponent's bet divided by the pot plus your opponent's bet. So here you have eight divided by 16, which equals 50%. One minus that number is 50%. Okay? So that means we must defend with 50% of our range or more. Otherwise, our opponent can immediately profit by bluffing with literally any two cards. Think about that, right? If we fold more than 50% of our range, our opponent immediately profits. So we can't fold more than 50% of our range or our opponent, who we know is going to run us over, that's what he's trying to do. He's going to crush us. So in this scenario, we actually need to spend significantly more than 50% of our range. And we want to make sure our defending range is going to be able to somewhat easily get to the river. So here's what we're doing. Take a look. We are calling with aces, kings, queens, jacks, ace, jack, maybe all of our hands in red, same, same hands in red, right? We are calling with our best draws. But if you think about the best draws, there really aren't very many of them, right? 
In this scenario though, with our gut shots, if we get our gut shot on the turn, we are gonna get paid off for a large amount very likely. So for that reason, we need to continue 10-9 and 10-8. And 9-8 is an open ender. If we add 5-4 in our range, which we should, um, that would also call, but it's not gonna change this too much. Um, queen, king, queen with a backdoor draw should be called, but not ace x with a backdoor draw. Why is that? Well, it's because the king and the queen has two over cards. And the showdown value is not so relevant because you're probably going to end up folding those hands by the river anyway. So here's what we're doing. We are calling with the hands in red, calling with the hands in blue. There are no hands in green, right? Because we only bet with good hands on the flop. We didn't bet our marginal made hands. And then we're folding our junk. We need to call with 50%. We're calling with uh, 62%. So that's pretty nice. This is typically what you need to be doing. Now, you may say, should we be re-raising with any hands? Well, what, what does that accomplish? First off, the board's very uncoordinated, right? Jack 7 6, there are very few straight draws available. And if the opponent does have a straight draw, he has 40% equity or, or less. You know, it's not that big of a deal. So we are definitely not worried about that. Um, so we don't need to protect. And the thing is, is you have to understand the maniac is check raising this with all sorts of garbage. If the guy's check raising with king four offsuit, you want to be re-raising middle set? No, because the opponent's drawing dead. If the guy has a jack, do you want to re-raise middle set? Well, yes, you do. But that's really the only time because if he doesn't have middle set, we're going to end up making the opponent fold out. Or if he doesn't have top pair, he's going to fold out way, way, way too often. And we don't want the guy to fold out, right? We want the player to stay in with all of his garbage. Remember, this guy sticks around with way too much trash, way too much garbage. So we don't want to re-raise. There is literally no merit. What is happening here? There's literally no merit in um, re-raising in, in this scenario with your best hands. Is calling down with ace high a good idea? When it checks behind on the flop, it is. What's the best way to study? Again, we're going to talk about all that later. I'm going to give you access to all of the tools you need to learn how to master this spot and spots just like this, facing tight players, loose players, aggressive players, being out of position, in position, in four-bet pots. Imagine any scenario. We're going to teach you the tools to that or give you the tools to that. Are you never going for a check raise? You can't go for a check raise, Michael. We are in position. When you're in position, you cannot check raise. Okay, so um, if for some reason you think your opponent's literally only raising with the nuts, then yes, sure, you can free, feel free to re-raise your best hands, but that's certainly not the case here. And you should definitely not assume some generic maniac is going to be raising you with only the nuts. The worst thing you can do against a maniac is to re-raise them whenever you have the nuts and they are drawing pretty much dead. And that's exactly what's happening here. How much should you deviate from any defense frequency for a maniac versus a tight aggressive player? Well, significantly, right? You need to defend way more than minimum defense frequency against the Maniac. You need to defend way less against someone who is tight. We're trying to keep his range as wide as possible. That is accurate. Michael, again, you cannot check raise. We're in position. When you're in position, you cannot check raise. You have to be out of position to check raise. Alex, no, we're talking about exactly this specific scenario here. You've been told you don't need to be balanced. Exactly. We're not balanced at all here. It's worth mentioning. We are not balanced, right? We are so not balanced in this scenario because look at our calling range. It is very strong. Calling range is very strong, all nut hands. We're going to be calling this player by the river way too much. We're about to show you. And that is incredibly exploitable and exploitative, right? If our opponent just stops bluffing us, he's going to do pretty well. No, he's not going to crush us because we still have some draws in our range. What a lot of people think is that if I think my opponent's a maniac, I just need to forget any concept of balance whatsoever. And instead, now I just need to literally only play the nuts and that's it. But if you do that, you're folding way too much. Why are queen jack and jack 10 a fold? Edward, queen jack and jack 10 are not folds. We checked queen jack and jack 10 on the flop. I understand this type of analysis may be new to some of you, but whenever you check behind on the flop, that means you don't have it in your betting range. Is this GTO with a bit of ex or exploitive poker with a bit of um, GTO? Uh, this is more baseline GTO and then adjusting hard to exploit whatever the opponents do wrong. Louis Flip says, what about the ace high backdoor flush draw? Should we call a check raise? Probably not due to lacking over cards and not being able to um, defend very well. 
All right, so let's keep moving forward. Right here, I say perhaps you could uh, re-raise small with some nuts and some draws. I don't think it's mandatory. If you are going to re-raise small, you want to do it with the worst draws and then the middle sets and 7-6. Those are the ones you want to be re-raising because those are the ones that are... Uh, whenever, we have, whenever you have seven or sixes, it's most likely your opponent is going to have a jack, right? If they are value betting. The problem, though, is that we're against a maniac. And if we're against a maniac, we definitely do not want to let them fold. Do not let the maniac fold. But it is nice to be able to bluff sometimes. So maybe in this scenario, you actually need to over bluff. Maybe bluff all of the crappy draws. That could be pretty sweet. How small of a, a re-raise? If he makes it eight, we can make it like 21 or 22. If you have to leave, can you replay this webinar? I don't know. Make sure on my email list. All right, on the turn, suppose we call. What happens on the turn? All the hands in gray go away, right? Because we folded them. Those hands are gone. Turn is a two of clubs. The opponent bets 22 big blinds. What do we do now? This is where we are about to exploit our opponent to death. Because take a look at this range, right? Our opponent's betting and betting on the large side. So minimum defense frequency is 50-ish percent again. Maybe it's 40%, something like that. Um, as you see, we're defending a full 70% of hands, which is a lot. And take a look at the 70% of hands we're defending. It's really, 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 really good, right? Like, we know we're not folding. This is where we are going to get paid. We have our opponent on the hook. Our opponent is has check raises on the flop, bet the turn. And, uh, well, they're probably going to jam the river. Notice we're now folding out the open-ended straight draws uh, with 9-8. You could certainly justify calling with 9-8 here. I don't really have a problem with that. Um, the problem is the opponent bets so big. If the opponent bets something like 16 big blinds, then you definitely need to call with the open-ended straight draws. But when you bet so big, it's okay to fold. And again, this is an exploitative strategy to take advantage of the fact that the opponent is bluffing way too often. And again, there's no need to raise for protection, uh, especially on a complete blank two-turn, because the opponent's drawing pretty much dead. And if the opponent's drawing pretty much dead, obviously we do not want to let him fold. Remember, we, this, we beat this opponent by letting him bluff. All right, here we are on the river. River is a two, which kills 7-6. Doesn't really kill 7-6 because 7-6 could be good, but it's still fine to fold 7-6. So in this scenario, our opponent jams for about pot. Again, we need to defend 50% of our range. We're defending <laughs> pretty much 100% of it. And um, here it is. We got to the river. We are crushing our opponent. And very importantly, we did so in a manner that makes us pretty much unexploitable based on what we expect him to do, right? We knew that we stuck around more than minimum defense frequency on all streets, which is great. Our flop checking behind range was well balanced, so that's great. And in this scenario, if your opponent does play like a maniac, you are just absolutely going to crush them. And this is how you do it. Um, very often, if your opponent does have a significant flaw in their strategy, it's quite easy to just tinker your range a little bit, either by you know continuation betting way too much and then folding if you get raised a ton against a tight player or against a maniac, uh, continuation betting a little bit less, and then uh, making your checking range strong and also your, your betting range strong, and that's going to put them in very, very bad shape. Do you like to play against these players? Absolutely. <laughs> Dan says, you're guessing don't look super happy when you call the turn. That is correct. JJ says, couldn't the opponent also have all the hands that we have? Yes, they could, but remember... This guy's going to be bluffing a lot. JJ, I'm not saying that we win this pot 100% of the time. Not at all, right? The opponent could just have a set of jacks and, and check, raise, flop, bet, turn, bet, river. But again, we have this player very clearly pegged as a maniac, right? If the opponent's very clearly pegged as a maniac, these hands are all going to be in great shape against their range. Why are we not folding king jack? Why would we possibly want to fold king jack? That crushes the opponent's range. You play against a lot of maniacs in cash, but don't encounter them so much in tournaments. Is that accurate? Um, I would generally say more people are just completely absurd in cash games because they can reload. But yes, um, the opponent could certainly have what we have. What's the pot size going to the turn? I don't know. Go back and figure it out. But it was pretty. It's, it's a roughly a pot size shove. If the opponent checks river, what would we do? Um, well, we haven't discuss that because that's not the scenario we were talking about, but I would likely use a small bet to give plenty of room to let my opponent jam. In this scenario, let's say pot was 67 big blinds, I'd bet something like 12 with everything here, including the 7-6 bluff. And if the opponent raised, then we fold the 7-6 and call with everything else. Sean says tournament players are generally worse post-flop. Um, 
depends on exactly what you're referring to. But in this scenario, um, I don't think tournament players are as maniacal as cash game players. You're surprised seven, six a fold. Yes, it's because of the two paired. That's right. Does it make sense to re-raise the Maniac on the turn? No, because that lets him fold. Don't let the Maniac fold. Listen, re-raising this Maniac on the flop or the turn is out of the question. For you, it's not easy to diagnose someone's a Maniac. You pay attention and see how aggressive they are. On the river, is the minimum fence frequency 33%? No. Minimum fence frequency is your opponent's one minus your opponent's bet, which is pot, divided by the bet size, pot, plus pot. It's one divided by two, so one is 50%. One minus 50% is 50%. Going back to the flop, someone wants to know um, what what are these ratios again? You want, at most, a 2 to 1 ratio draws to value hands, less if you're going to be getting played at aggressively. So here you see we have less. It's close. I'm sorry, this is the wrong one. Here we have a 1.5 to 1 ratio. So you want 1.5 to 1, maybe 1 to 1 even, uh, draws to premium made hands against the Maniac. Against most people, though, uh, two, two draws to one premium made hand. And then your marginal hands... You want roughly 70% marginal made hands, 30% junk. And um, that's assuming you're betting the premium made hands and draws. This is a polarized strategy, right? Just good fundamentally sound poker. And you're checking with a condensed range, which is also good fundamentally sound poker. Maniacs are the easiest to play against in cash games. I completely agree because you just don't fold. If you turn a back door draw with 9-8, should we raise the turn? Quite possibly. If River doesn't pair, do we call 7-6? Of course. Say we turn a back door draw... So yeah, if that going to the turn, I mentioned this here, right? Perhaps you should uh, re-raise small in the turn with a few nut hands and some draws, or maybe if you want to be super exploitative, you could raise them with all sorts of, of of draws on the turn, because all these hands are not quite good enough to stick around with. So you could consider jamming. Louis Flute says, "What happens if with a hand like tens, if our opponent bets the turn, we call on the river. Our opponent goes all in for uh, what five times the size of the pot." You probably fold, but realize you're well protected. What was a flop check call to check fold ratio? You want to be sticking around based on the minimum defense frequency. You typically want 70% marginal made hands to 30% draws. All right. The opponent checked, so we discussed that. We discussed this. How many hands would it take for me to be confident someone's a maniac? You have to understand, you don't have to be confident. You just have to be happy enough to risk your money on it. <laughs> if, I'm, uh, if I'm thinking my opponent's in there betting aggressively, if I've seen them make a river bet or two in spots where I thought they probably shouldn't be betting a whole lot, if I've seen them three betting a lot, if I've seen them check raising a lot, all of this will make me think our opponent's a maniac and we're going to adjust accordingly. Do we modify our opening range a lot? We definitely are. Remember, I said that we should be opening about 50% of hands pre-flop, but I'm only opening 30% here because we're against Maniac. We're against the Maniacs. <sighs> All right. What is the pre-flop shoving range against the Maniac? I don't even know what that means because we're playing 100 big blinds deep. We're not, we're not shoving pre-flop against the Maniac. All right, so hope you all enjoyed this. This was actually... One of our past poker coaching homework challenges. Um, poker coaching is my training site where we have homework challenges and quizzes just like this. This one was from November recently. We also had one right before it, how to play against weak tight players. We had another one, how to play against loose and aggressive, or um, very good players in very similar spots. And I think it was all very, very educational. Normally, poker coaching is $39 a month, but we're running a special right now. So... Go check it out. Go to pokercoaching.com pokercoaching slash new year where you can get a substantial discount. If you want to sign up for 36 months, three years, you can get it for $299, which is actually a heck of a value, assuming you know you want to work hard in your poker game and continue studying. We also are offering lots and lots of bonuses. Actually, let me just go show you the sales page. Um, as you see, here's what you get at pokercoaching.com. We have 400 interactive hand quizzes that... Um, we add more to every week. We have at least four new quizzes a week. We have over 30 webinars, very similar to this, except for instead of me just going through my answer, I make you give me your answer ahead of time. That's your homework. And then I go through an answer and look at and grade every single person's answer and try to figure out specifically what you are doing wrong in these spots. And that way you can fix it, right? 
it'll be fantastic. That's the best way to improve. It's like, it's like going to school to some extent. And we have a new challenge just like this every single month, which continues to add lots and lots of content to the site. And you get bonus stars. You may say, what are bonus stars? Well, if you sign up, let's talk about the bonus stars, right? If you sign up for one year, you get two free poker videos worth $97 each, which will be 10 reward stars. Um, three years, you get five. I'm sorry, two, two years, you get five. Three years, you get 10. And uh, let me show you what can re you can redeem these for because I think they're quite educational. So some of my favorite webinars here that I have done with players in the past, how to level up. Here's a good one. How to go from being, you know, just an okay player to a legitimately serious player. How to beat wild games. You want to know more about how to beat maniacs? This is um, from me playing a tournament against a lot of really just loose and aggressive players. That's just how it happened. We have um, some webinars with Phil Helmuth where he goes through a lot of the hands he played over the course of winning his 14 bracelets. We have some content by Matt Affleck, world-class poker player, also a PokerCoaching.com coach. We have Olivier Bousquet, one of my favorite poker players. I've looked up to him for a very long time. Uh, Eddie says that the webinar with Olivier was great. I completely agree. And um, we have lots and lots of webinars. Tuning into Tells by the Tells Expert. Neutralized Position by Alex Fitzgerald. As you see, we have lots and lots of webinars that you can pick. Whatever you want, whatever you're having problems with. And, you know, if you sign up to this and you don't know what you want because we have lots of options, send me, an e send me a little email about yourself. Don't send me a life story, but send me a little email and I will direct you to the best way to use your bonus credits. Because, you know, like say you play live poker, but you probably want to get a live at the bike one where I go through hands from live at the bike, right? Say you know you're going to the World Series of Poker. Maybe the World Series of Poker preparation videos are for you. Say you play, or say you have a problem with bluffing. You just don't even know how to do it. If you never know how to do it, if you don't know how to bluff, right, you need to get some experience. So anyway, that's what we have available. If you use the offers today, here's the price we're actually selling it for. But if you use the code New Year, you get $700 off of the most expensive package. And um, it's, a, it's a decent value. What is this? Oh, here's one of my students. He won a tournament. We've actually had a lot of people winning tournaments recently, which is really exciting. Um, the most exciting one, we'll spoil that one first, is um, a guy, Scarmaker, who took third place in the party poker, uh, I think it was 10 million guarantee. He got in through a $5 satellite and cashed for 1.3 million. I'm actually getting him prepared for the World Series of Poker now, so that's very exciting. We have Ken Adams here. He won a tournament of some sort, Maryland number 18, which is always all very exciting. And um, someone else just won a World Series of Poker bracelet, or World Series of Poker circuit ring in, um, where was that? Thunder Valley. A guy named Tom. So that was fantastic. So if you want to get this cheat sheet, here's where you can go get it. You can go get it at pokercoaching.com slash cheat sheet MP3. This is my tournament cheat sheet. I take a look at it every time before I play. And I definitely suggest you do this too. It'll keep lots and lots of important points in mind to you so that you think about the things that matter and don't get overwhelmed by things that don't matter. A lot of you are saying that you have a lot of these webinars and they were really, really great. Well, good. I'm glad to hear it. Let's see. If you have, if you already subscribed to Poker Coach and can you sign up for this? You absolutely can. Rick, are we folding two pair on the river with seven, six? Yes, because seven, six is not very good whenever the bottom card pairs on the river. Do I consider myself a maniac? Absolutely not. So um, I'm going to answer some questions now. Whatever questions you all have, feel free to type them in. I realize we have hundreds of people here today. So I'm probably not going to be able to get to all of your questions, but I will do my best to do it, okay? Don't be annoyed if I don't get to it. There are literally hundreds of people here, and you're all asking me questions. Um, Eddie says, you wish he was advanced enough to think this fast, to think as fast as I talk. <laughs> Listen, I have a lot of experience thinking about poker. When you know something very well, very often it's, I'm not going to say subconscious, but you're, you're quite good at it, right? Like whenever you're driving a car, everyone can drive a car pretty well as long as they you know, have decent reflexes, right? Or if you play any sort of sport, it'd be like me trying to go play soccer today. I've never played soccer in my life. If I tried to do that, I would be a disaster. Um, with lots and lots of experience, you will get better at this. You'll be able to put your opponents on ranges and put yourself on ranges like this and figure out the game theory optimal strategy, and then how to adjust to it because you will have experience. That's the really important thing here is you all have to get in there and get experience 
putting people on ranges. Otherwise, you're just pressing buttons, right? Those 50 people who sent me an email saying, what was our hand? They have never done this. The idea of a range is foreign to them. And they're drawing pretty thin if they ever try to play against any sort of decent poker players. And I want to make sure that you all are not drawing thin. All right, what can you do if your image is that of a maniac and you think someone at the table will play back at you? Well, start playing a little bit tighter, right? Or realize that player may decide to try to bluff you. If they're going to try to bluff you, then, well, clearly, you need to make sure you have something that can call them down. What's the different things people would learn at my site as opposed to my books? Well, the site is very, well, it has a lot of these challenges like this, right? This is unlike any book. I did my best with Mastering Small Stakes and No Limit Hold'em to get the fundamentals across. But even then, this is practice, right? Books are, to, for the most part, theory and like lessons and putting the fundamentals in your mind. But actually getting in there, practicing, and then having someone grade your work, which, you know, like I said, I grade every single student's answer to the challenge each month. And also, um, whenever you take the quizzes, you can get, at, I mean, you get immediate feedback from that too. So it's, it's, like, it's like private coaching is really what it is. So it's very different. How do you manage time with your family? I play a lot of poker when I play poker, and I play almost no poker when I'm home with my family. I had a baby uh, two months ago, my second son. I have a two-year-old as well, and I knew when I had both of them, actually, I wanted to stay home for about six months because that seemed like the responsible thing to do. So here we are, helping all of you instead of being out on the road trying to help only myself. Uh, Martin says, poker coaching is by far the best value out there. Well, good. I'm glad to hear it. Will there be a time in your life where you will be playing more tournaments? Well, I mean, I'm definitely going to ramp it up after six months or so, but I definitely am not going to be playing like I used to play in the past where I would be gone, well, literally all the time. I would, I, there, there's a period where I never went home for a year. Uh, that does not seem ideal. What's the proper bankroll strategy to play $50 cash games? Ryan, I have an article for you. Actually, it's more like a, it's a, it's a book. <laughs> Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. If you go to jonathanlowpoker.com slash bankroll, you can, um, you'll see all of my advice for bankroll management. What's the best way to treat individual chip models? Some problems on that stage. I would suggest you practice in a lot of spots dealing with payout jumps, right? There's a site called ICMizer that will allow you to essentially take quizzes there on specific ICM all in or fold scenarios, and that might be very useful for you. In general, though, just know you're not trying to go broke, and then you want to be pushing around people who can go broke. If you're a profitable tournament player, do I recommend you playing cash games too? <sighs> Depends on what you're trying to do with your time, right? The problem with tournaments is that you can't play a ton of volume unless you're playing specifically online, which you say you are. Um, so if that's the case, then if you're already putting in a lot of volume and you're, you're profiting in a decent amount, I would tell you you probably don't need to branch out. But if you're trying to learn something different for a reason, a very specific reason, then... Like say you want to be able, only have to play whenever you feel like it, or let's say you want to be able to sit down and put in three hours and quit. Well, then in that scenario, um, may, maybe you do want to to change. Can I paraphrase the concept of minimum defense frequency? Basically, whenever you bet, if you steal the pot more than one, I'm sorry, if you steal the pot more than your bet size divided by your bet size plus the pot, you're going to immediately profit with your bluffs. If you immediately profit with your bluffs, you can bluff 100% of hands. So let's say you bet 20% pot. If your opponent folds more than 20% divided by the pot, 100% plus 20%, if they fold more than one-sixth of the time, you immediately profit. I'm sorry, if you steal the pot more than one-sixth of the time. So they have to defend a lot when you bet tiny. If you bet huge, they don't have to defend very often at all, right? I discuss this in my book, um, Mastering Small Stakes and No Limit Hold'em. Do you feel you have a master of your emotions at the table? Absolutely. I'll show you all. Someone who helped me. Let's see if I can... Oops. Clicking on Phil Helmuth. Phil Helmuth did not help me with my emotions. <laughs> um, Elliot Rowe, wherever he is. Here he is. Focus, professionalism, and dealing with downswings. Elliot Rowe helped me a ton with my mindset. And to be fair, I didn't even work with him that long. But Elliot helped me a lot when it came to... Just understanding that my silly thoughts are silly thoughts and forget about them. You don't need to worry about your emotions because your emotions are irrelevant. If you're a good player, it's like you're the roulette table at a casino. If your opponent gets lucky and gets this, their lucky number on you, that's fine. It doesn't matter. 
because in the long run, you're going to crush them. Jared Tindler helped you a lot as well. Yeah, we have uh, we have videos with Jared Tindler too, somewhere in here. Here we have Jared Tindler and also Trisha Cardner, th the three best mindset experts in poker, right here for you, completely accessible. And you'll get, well, ideally 10 of these videos if you sign up for three years using pokercoaching.com slash new year. What heads up do you display to use? It's called GALF2. If anyone has any questions about this promotion, by the way, please email us at support at pokercoaching.com. What's the MP3 link again? Here it is, pokercoaching.com slash cheat sheet MP3. If you're an Inner Circle member and you want to renew, send us an email. We'll figure it out. How long do you have for this promotion? You have four days. Better hurry up, though. How long are the videos on average? Um, most of these videos over here in the rewards page, they're roughly four hours long, each of them. So we're giving you tons and tons and tons and tons of coaching on exactly what you want to learn and what you know you need to learn. Do you believe in intuition? Of course, intuition exists. Do you recommend any information regarding the subject? No, I recommend instead, if you're worried about intuition, I would highly, highly, highly suggest you study the fundamentals and get good at poker. People interested in the inner circle, go to pokercoaching.com slash inner circle and you can read all about it. How do I feel my first tournament book has aged? I think it's actually aged incredibly well. I'm actually, don't ruin this for me, but I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of editing it and rewriting it because it's coming up on its 10-year anniversary and it turns out almost everything I said in there was very, very close to Game Theory Optimal, which is pretty cool to think that eight years ago, nobody knew what Game Theory Optimal was and we came up with roughly the right plays. Um, there were a few spots where I was a little bit off. Um, I wasn't defending the big blind enough. I With a short stack, and especially I wasn't defending with a short stack often enough. Deep stack we were doing fine, but short stack I was not playing so well, or at least as well. Um, so yeah. What's the difference between this site and other sites? If you have not been listening to this PowerPoint or this, this presentation, I'm not really sure how to help you. I, I already explained exactly what the site is. If you go to pokercoaching.com slash new year sale, is that it? No, pokercoaching.com slash new year, you will see specifically what you get with the site. That's very different than all the other training sites out there where they just give you videos and say, have at it. This is not a passive learning site. This is not for someone who wants to sit back and have a beer and make fun of other poker players and try to make themselves feel good about their lives. Here, we are trying to actually help you better your life by making you a skilled poker player. And I understand that's not for everyone and that's okay. Let's see. Will I be giving classes for all three years? I definitely will. I've already committed to doing it for at least five years. JJ Cohen says this site is way more interactive than every other poker training site. I know that. <laughs> I know that I learn by having someone coach me. I've had tons of private coaches. I mean, for those who don't know, I have spent gosh, $30,000, $40,000 on private coaches over my career. And it's paid off, right? But at the same time, I know a lot of people don't have that type of money to spend. They, they can't spend thirty dollars or $40,000. But, you know, $300 for essentially three years of, call it semi-private coaching for me, Alex Fitzgerald, and Matt Affleck, the other coaches at PokerCoaching.com, is a heck of a value. Can we talk about straddling? I mean... Straddling is one of those things where it really doesn't change things a whole lot. It just makes the gameplay twice as big. But if the stacks are already only 100 big blinds, it just makes you play a shallow stack game. So straddles on 100 big blind games essentially make the game way more luck oriented. And that may or may not be what you're trying to accomplish. Around what big blind range do you consider shoving on a maniac as a bluff value? Keith, I'm not sure what that means. You don't understand why we folded Queen Jack. We did not fold Queen Jack. We checked behind with Queen Jack on the flop. No, oh, here it is. We checked behind Queen Jack on the flop. That means we don't have it in our range when we bet. Your local casino, it's a 20 big blind game. Pre-flop, it looks odd. Raises look odd and most people are trying to see flops. What should you be doing? When it goes limp, 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 jam it all in when you should have an edge. If you already are signed up for PokerCoaching.com or the Inner Circle, either one, um, send us an email, support at PokerCoaching.com, and we will figure something out. 
Are we anticipating any additional coaches? We are actually in the process of that right now. Believe it or not, it's kind of hard to make quizzes. It's hard to do these homework webinars. I mean, you see me today in, in this challenge, I had a, a, a few minor errors and a lot of people don't want to do work. They don't want to stand here at their computer and work for all of you for hours on end. I literally work eight hours a day, at least for you all pretty much every day. I'm going to say on average, I don't know, 20 days a month. That's a lot of work, right? A lot of people don't want to do that. Now, of course, they're not running the site and answering everyone's questions and all that, but it does take a lot of time and effort to make the quizzes. So it's hard to get coaches because at first I need someone who I know is good and I need someone who I know is reliable. And that's hard, hard to do. What is the inner circle? The inner circle, in addition to everything you get here, you also get access to two office hour calls every month where you can call in and ask me your questions live for about 15 minutes. Also in those, I present strategy sessions where it's a 30 minute presentation on the topics of the inner circle's choice. Um, sometimes we're talking about a very specific thing like how to balance your range in a particular scenario. Sometimes we're talking about like broad topics like bluffing. Sometimes we're talking about mindset issues. Like the la one of the more recent ones was someone was just generally afraid their opponents were going to be putting them in bad spots, but it turns out they really just weren't, right? So we talk about all sorts of very specific topics. Whatever give the inner circle members problems. What is the best online cash game stakes to play for preparation and playing 1-2 live? Um, pretty small. Not a lot. Not very big. You don't need to play big online. Did I contribute to the book Modern Poker Theory? I edited it, and I also added lots and lots of comments to ensure that those things were discussed. We have a book coming out soon with Michael Acevedo called Modern Poker Theory. It's going to be groundbreaking. Um, it really just lays out even more in depth how to play game theory optimal and then how to adjust your opponents. In a tournament, when you're short stack, use a push-fold strategy. Recently, you played in a survivor tournament where there were no payout bombs. Use a push-fold and bubbled. That was a mistake. Later, you thought the push fold was not applicable. That is definitely true. Push fold charts are garbage on the bubble. Absolute garbage on the bubble. Do not use a push fold chart on the bubble at the final table, anything like that. And you're going to be way better than if you do. I just did a, an episode of A Little Coffee about this, about why charts are bad or when charts are bad, and then also how to use them uh, beneficially. And I'm not going to rehash that, but if you go to youtube.com slash float the turn f-l-o-a-t-t-h-e-t-u-r-n find a little coffee for me i think it was from monday how do you play in a home game that ends in a four or five hours which means the blinds go up very quickly very often you just play the optimal strategy for each stack size you have that's all you can do you get concerned if you bet a lot of draws you're bleeding chips from a game theory optimal point of view you can have two draws to one premium made hands. Just make sure your premium made hands are very good. What's my favorite starting hand? Aces. You all type in lots of questions. This is good. Let's see. Is the inner circle part of poker coaching? Yes, if you are in the inner circle, you have access to everything in poker coaching. Louis Philippe said, you're currently playing 1-2 <laughs> today. You made $475 using the stuff you learned from poker coaching. Good job. Is 25 no limit comparable to 1-2 live? They're still different. Live is just way more of weak, loose, passive. Do you have any material on Potlum and Omaha 8 or better? No. What's the difference between a maniac and loose aggressive? Maniacs are generally just more aggressive. Speaking of Survivor, am I still applying? I've applied a few times. They have not accepted me. How do you decide if a final table chop is fair? <laughs> Funny enough, you asked that. I have a video coming out about that sometime in the near future. I also have a blog post, jonathanlittlepoker.com slash let's not make a deal. Go read that. If you all are already a member of Poker Coaching and want to upgrade, extend your membership, anything like that, send us an email at support at pokercoaching.com. Any recommendations for a simple math book? Mastering small stakes, no limit hold'em is all you need to know. It's not going to be necessarily super simple, but it will get you on the right path. Is it better to play with or with, on sites with HUDs or without HUDs? Depends on how much you rely on HUDs, essentially. 
in between tournaments, do you pad your bankroll with cash games or sit and goes? Um, I don't really think about poker like that. It, I was always a little bit fortunate in that I got a lot of my money from playing online a long time ago, playing only sit and goes. Then I moved to live tournaments and quickly moved up to relatively high stakes. And I was always someone who would sit there and grind a lot, right? Like I'm not playing one tournament a month. I used to play as many as I could. So I didn't really have free time to, to pad my bankroll in between or however you want to call it. Um, I, I didn't, I wasn't someone who didn't play a lot. I was, I was not a lazy poker player. Believe it or not, I'm actually not all that lazy. <laughs> it would be nice to see me playing more. Understand I have a baby and my baby is, sorry, more important than you. <laughs> actually, my baby and my wife. All right, what's the biggest challenge going from playing sit and goes to live tournaments to cash games? That's the progression I took. You have to understand, sit and goes pay 30% of the field. Tournaments pay 10 or 15%, and getting in the money in a tournament doesn't matter. So tournaments actually really only pay like 1% of the field. So it's a very, very different strategy. Cash games, you're just trying to win chips. How many big blinds per hour is a good win rate in cash? Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll and read that. You played 2-4 online and got crushed. Well, 2-4 online is a pretty tough game. What videos do I recommend to help you play that level? Well, send me an email. That's actually a good, a good question for people to email me whenever they go and they sign up. And we will find you the adequate stuff. Is this webinar an ad? At the end of it is, did you miss the first 45 minutes of it where we discuss this in-depth situation? How do you know people getting lucky over and over again? It doesn't matter the fact that they get lucky over and over again. Do you have enough time to field all the inner circle questions? So funny enough, you asked that. Whenever I first started the inner circle, the office hours would go about two hours. I present on the topic they wanted for about 30 minutes. And then I would answer questions for about an hour and a half or two hours. Now the inner circle webinars go about four and a half hours, maybe five. <laughs> so, you know, we're getting more members. And really not even all the members ask questions live. A lot of them can't be there live because it just doesn't work with their schedule. But they email them in and I, I answer every question that comes in. I mean... I realize if you all are in the inner circle, you are the people who are relying on me to help you become world-class poker players and you're devoting a lot of time to it. I'm happy to devote all of my time to those types of people. So I have no problem doing it all day if that's what it comes to. <laughs> Is there anywhere on my site you can find about how to play against maniacs slower and in more detail? PokerCoaching.com. This is not the only homework challenge we've done on how to exploit maniacs. We've done quite a few of them, actually. What are my thoughts on a book I've never read? I don't know. If you have questions, AJ, email us. We will make it happen. What's the difference between Poker Coaching and Float the Turn? If you're a member of Poker Coaching, you get Float the Turn for free. It's just one more perk. Inner Circle is essentially an even more advanced version of poker coaching. All right, where do I get a strong desire to help others? Listen, I know that I would not be anywhere near as good as I am today. I probably would just not even be in poker if it was not for the help of lots of people who came before me, right? Funny enough, the site pokercoaching.com was actually owned by my first poker coach. He bought the domain back in like 1998 or something. His name was Bill, Bill Seymour. He was my first coach. He taught me a lot about mindset, a lot about how to just be a pro. And um, he eventually retired, right? He's, he's an older guy. And I took over the site. I've had so many mentors who helped me along the way for no, for no real reason besides they want to help other people who want to improve their lives. And I'm, I'm the same. I want to help people who want to improve their lives. What's the best app to trap live hand histories? Paper and pen. Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash notes. Will I be in Vegas in, on March 20th? No. How skilled of a player do you need to benefit from my coaching? Listen, the cool thing about poker coaching is that if you go back to the very oldest homework challenge, it's not all that difficult. The ones that we have like this actually are pretty difficult. And I mean, it's, it's difficult to come up with these ranges, right? I mean, you, you saw me mess up a time or two in it. And I mean, I, I pretty much know what I'm doing. So um, this is stuff. This is tough stuff, right? And I get that, but if you go back to the beginning, start from the beginning and work your way forward, you will know how to do this relatively easily. We have a few students who have been with us for, I mean, since we started the site 30 months ago, and they get the homework questions pretty much right most of the time because they're now very good poker players. Where do you start in poker coaching? The oldest quiz and the oldest homework are my 
recommendations for where to start. The homework challenges take a little bit more time than the quizzes. The quizzes are relatively fast. So you can do those in like five or 10 minutes, right? But the challenges take much longer. Would I recommend full ring or zoom? Full ring is way, uh, way easier than zoom. What portion of your hands do you feel like you should have done something different with upon further analysis? Not many. Some, not many. Because I've studied a lot, right? In large tournaments, you've typically run... Uh, Frank, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. You're not trying to run a bluff with X percentage of cards. You're trying to just play your range to the best of your ability. It's not like I'm supposed to be bluffing 30% of the time or anything like that. So how do I play my range? And if you just happen to have all the best hands in your range, right? Like say you just end up with a bunch of these hands in red, or you just end up with a bunch of these hands in green that are marginal made, you're not going to be bluffing that day. Eddie, I'm not sure what you mean in, return, in referring to the big blind ante. Essentially, big blind ante is irrelevant. It's the same as the normal ante. It does not matter. I do not go back and answer past homework questions. Otherwise, that would take me forever. But I have my recording up of every single past homework challenge I have made. And also, um, I, I have the recording up of every single answer I've given to my students. So... Someone there probably gave roughly the same answer. Find it and see what I said about that. Um, by the way, if you are all still on the fence about whether or not to sign up to Poker Coaching, um, you can sign up for a free trial membership. You'll have access to a few of the quizzes and the homework challenges. But if you're on the fence, go give it a try. If you don't like the site, I don't want you to spend money on the site, right? I want to make sure that you all are happy and getting full value. I mean, I can pretty much tell you all immediately, if, if you sign up and you study and you work hard, you're going to make way more than $300 off this material. You're probably going to make thousands, if not more. And um, you can get the free trial at pokercoaching.com, so give it a try. Ed says, you highly recommend everyone sign up. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> How is the aggressor different if they're on the left or the right? Very different. It's beyond the scope of this webinar. What time are the inner circles? They are typically, well, I put them at two different times. Um, I do one typically on a Monday and one typically on a Friday. Usually different times. One's in the morning, one's in the afternoon. If you have the nut, should you convince yourself that you're holding a worse hand? Um, no, I don't really think like that. The way I think, look, I'll literally tell you all how I think, is I think in spots like this, I have queen 10 suited. I don't think this is garbage, I'm scared. I think this is an easy bet. Why is this an easy bet? Because it's one of the hands in blue and it's in my betting range. That's it. I'm not sitting there thinking, oh my God, I'm afraid, right? Ed says, you've been a member of the Inner Circle now for about a year, and you have Final Table three tournaments, and you took first place in a WPT 30K guarantee at Gardens recently. Good job. Congrats on that. On the flop, are you primarily basing your C-bet sizing on the flop texture? So, Michael, I have a video. Find it on YouTube. When to continuation bet and how much. That video will explain, well, when to continuation bet and how much. How many hours a week do you need to make poker coaching worth it? What does quote-unquote worth it mean? I mean, I, I read almost every book and study lots and lots of poker players. And I think if I spend $100 or $1,000 on anything, it's probably worth it because I know I'm going to put it to good use, right? If I pick up one tip, if I add one thing to my arsenal that makes me just even a little bit of a better poker player, because I'm playing very high stakes, it's well worth it. Now, if you're playing you know, one cent, two cent online, it's going to take you a long time to recoup the $300 just because you're playing tiny, tiny stakes, right? Um, that said, it may still be worth it because you may not get anywhere without it. But the, the idea of worth it in life is all a matter of perspective, right? Like, what, what are you trying to do in life? If you sign up and you play one quiz and then you don't use it ever again, is that worth $300 for a three-year membership? No, clearly not. But if you go through the whole site, and I promise you, you can get through everything in three years, even though we are adding new stuff every month, but you can certainly get through... Um, a lot of the content, if you actually do sit there, study, and work hard, yes, it's worth it because you're going to improve not just your poker but your life. And that's what we're trying to do here. But this is not just a uh, poker training course. This is a get your life on track and achieve what you want. So anyway, that's going to be it for this webinar. I think I got through all of your questions, so thank you all for submitting them. Again, sign up for the New Year bonus. It is a heck of a deal. You can get it at pokercoaching.com slash new year. If you're on the fence, go to pokercoaching.com, get the completely free trial membership. 
And um, like I said, if you do sign up and you get your bonus videos and you don't exactly know what to get or you're not sure which one is ideal for you, send me an email. I will personally go through the videos, find a video that fits whatever your needs are. So, I mean, listen, at the end of the day, I'm just happy to help all of you. I hope you've enjoyed this. Make sure you um, follow me on Twitter and YouTube and all those places because I often do post very exclusive things there that only apply to those um, outlets. So make sure you check that out. And again, check out the sale, pokercoaching.com slash new year.